Good morning. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the fifth truth, the truth of personality, ego, and soul. So let me start off by explaining those three terms. I first want to identify the soul, which is the thing that animates you as a diamond. This diamond, when it's sort of uh, dunked in the honey that I mentioned in fifth and the fourth truth, is your personality, is your ego. It feels separate. It feels as if it has low level consciousness and it wears masks. You cannot eliminate the ego and the personality. They are part of what animates you. They're sort of linked to the material nature of the human. Whereas the soul is directed purpose, directed will. It sort of takes you in the right direction. A lot of what I talk about with clients is this idea of your value system. What are your top two values? Not family, defining them in measurable terms. You don't know where you're headed. You don't know your directed will or your purpose if you don't have a very clear philosophy of life, a rule book, or at least your top two value systems defined. So that's the brilliance of the soul. It already knows, it already has a direction. It's gonna take you exactly to where you're headed once you sort of clean off the sort of layers of the personality and the ego that keep you from divining, defining that value system. So. I've been invited to work on a project to do some socio-emotional um, learning curriculum for the school system. And I reviewed what was the offering and I felt that it was not in alignment with my value system. And I approached the people on the project and I said, are you willing to rewrite the curriculum? I've been invited to, to write the lesson plans. Are you willing to kind of incorporate something new, something that hasn't been done? One of the things that we always want to do is go to higher consciousness, higher level thinking. So a lot of these programs on SEL, it's compassion and kindness and humanity and considerate. Well, if we don't attack the sort of personality and the ego and the low level consciousness or that mass consciousness that we learned about in the fourth truth, then we can't really work in the divinity in the higher level consciousness of the soul. So my invitation to these people is, can we do something different? Instead of going automatically to compassion and kindness, which is high level consciousness, can we talk about unmet needs? Can we talk about judgment? Can we talk about having clear value systems defined, even if they appear to be gluttonous or greedy or, or, or wealth-based? And those are the conversations we don't want to have. This is going to be the individuation process. The fifth truth is all about the individuation process. The number five is called the number of man. It's a midpoint between coming whole to be the whole man and the number 10, which really in numerology boils down to one plus zero is one, which is one, which is the beginning. So a whole new cycle. So we have to move from in astrology, the fourth house to the fifth house, the low level animal consciousness of the manger into the individual consciousness. This does not mean do you boo, I can do whatever I want. That's not what individuation is, but it is about taking that brilliant soul, that energy that's directed with a purpose, true to my value systems and following that trajectory and that path. If these people happen to come back to me and say, no, we want to kind of follow the status quo, then I know it doesn't align with my values and I can simply gracefully exit the project and, and, and decline. But if we don't know our value systems, if we don't know the sort of soul's purpose and soul direction linked to those values, that philosophy of life, that rule book of life, then we're going to constantly stay in the personality and the ego, which is what we are not. In Vedanta, it says you are not your thoughts, you are not your emotions, you are not your body, you're simply the observer. So the observer, there's a sense of detachment from the thoughts, emotions, and desires, but you cannot get to the observer, you cannot get to the higher level consciousness unless you're aware of your thoughts, your emotions, and your desires, your personality, your ego, which up until the moment that you start defining clearly your values and living 
true to those values as non-negotiables are dictating your life. So the universal law that I'd like to talk about primarily is the law of octaves. My first book, The Seven Gates, is written on this law. There's seven gates, seven steps to the model. The first three are child, the last four are the adult, and there's a shock in the middle that's the teenager. So this law is not found in the Kabbalion. This law was actually sort of resuscitated, if you will, by the philosopher named Gurdjieff. And he uses the Enneagram to describe this. This is also something that Tesla talked about, the forces of 369. This has been written a lot about um, esoterically, and it is linked to the law of octaves, also known as the law of sevens, the law of nines, the law of threes. So there's a lot of different names, but basically it's the law of octaves. And what it means is raising consciousness one whole octave. That is all we're here to do. Low level consciousness in the fourth, in the fourth house of astrology, the manger, the low level consciousness you got at conception, and then you raise it one vibration, one octave in the fifth house of individuation. Then you can continue the rest of the truths to live as a true being and going around purifying and in balance and confronting your shadow and wisdom and so forth. So the first three steps are do, re, mi, like in an octave on the musical scale. At me, there is a shock. The number three has to do with thought. So Shava, um, Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, a proton, neutron, electron, positive, negative, neutral. We'll see this in all different philosophies and traditions. There's three. Upon three, hence the law of threes, there is a shock. I call that the teenager. The shock or in the teenager in my system is the moment where you pause. The three is the thought, the emotion, the desire that kind of keeps you in this negative feedback loop in your low level consciousness. When you have the shock or the thought stops, you take a breath, then you can decide if you want to go into the adult steps and the square is linked to the material to sort of structure or crisis or adulting whereas the triangle is always linked to the thought so now the energy materializes either in the body if you do nothing to it which can lead to illness or it's some action that you take but there is a shock at the me to indicate that you're going to continue going in the raising of consciousness level most of us around new year's we write a new year's resolution by the second day of the year we've thrown it out the window nothing's materialized so this would be equivalent to paying for the gym membership or showing up or buying the sneakers or buying the fruits and vegetables for the diet it's the actual action step this is not enough for transmutation this is usually where behavior change models end if you look at the trans theoretical model of behavior change for instance one of the most popular public health models, it goes from action to maintenance and all the way back to pre-contemplation. We never reach the next shock. The next shock is after T, where we have a shock, we raise consciousness. There is a belief system change. This is the key between transformation, which is behavior change, to a new vibration, a new level of consciousness, transmutation. It is only with that raising of the vibration from the low level consciousness from conception that you can actually do individuation process. It might appear that there's an individuation process, but if there's no belief change, then you will not individuate. You will simply stay in transformation and it appears that that's what you're doing. So I mentioned before, there's a difference between the ego, personality, and soul, but yet there is not much difference. It's the way that you're materializing or showing up in the world. Ego and personality are linked to more of the material form, the body, the low-level consciousness, sort of that honey that wraps the diamond, whereas the soul is the diamond itself without that extra low-level vibration or low-level consciousness. So the ego developed at the moment of conception. At the moment of conception, 
your snow globe was shattered. You were literally kicked out of heaven, the universe, the garden of Eden, whatever you believe in. Your soul, your universal consciousness was castrated and put into a limitation, what feels to be a limitation, which is a body. That consciousness makes you feel separate. The ego is simply that you feel separate from another, either narcissistic, I am better, or I am less than, I am not worthy, I feel abandoned. There has been some distinction between you and the other. When we go finish around the 12 truths, you're going to see that truth 11 and then truth 12 is when we release dogma and we actually are in unification with all others, where we really incorporate the law of correspondence that others are me, I am others, we need others, others lead me, others feed me, and that exchange. And that's not till truth 11 and 12. So here, there, it, the ego is necessary. Like when we get out of our mother's body and we're placed on our mother, they don't do that so much now, especially with all the C-sections, but there was something that was served to the child to identify he or she was different than the mother's womb and now is separate from the body. So it gives us boundaries and it's necessary. As much as I might love my children or my partner or my friends and family, I need a distinction, a separation. This is what keeps us on our throne. This is what keeps us on our side of the street, not giving too much of our time, energy, and resources or money. Our personality is our thoughts, emotions, and desires. This is why you have the spiritual TED Talk every day. When you start looking at your impure thoughts, emotions, and desires, you realize it's your personality that makes you feel that you are separate. This is what keeps that diamond or the soul covered, thinking that others have to meet your needs, not that you can meet your own needs and feeling that you're not enough. And the soul is basically the diamond, the spirit that animates you, your aspect of your divineness, divinity, of your divine self that lives within your confined sort of body, you know, space. So I often equate the universe to a big cookie dough. And then if you're going to make cookies, you have to grab part of the cookie dough and put it on the plan and plop, plop, plop. Well, my little cookie dough that lives in me, that animates me, that tells me, Francis, this is the way you show up in the world when you've individuated, when you've raised your consciousness, is indeed the soul. This is directed, this has purpose, this has direction, this shines. This is linked to my value system that tells me that's the way. You can turn down these people if it violates your value system. And there's no hard feelings because you're honoring rather than self-betraying. So this is important. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about the Nemean lion and confronting the personality Albeit it's important, we have to recognize how it creeps up and takes away our power. So this is the tree of life from the Kabbalah. And I'm basically just focusing on this triangle right here. You've got self-love, which is creativity, sexuality, the way you express yourself. That's the fifth house in astrology, anything that you create. And from there, you have splendor and victory. In the Bible, it was representative of Aaron, Moses, and then Joseph, who was the king of Egypt. But Joseph was actually thrown in a ditch, thrown into slavery, sold by his brothers, went through a lot of chaos before he was acknowledged for his prophecy, and the Pharaoh made him king of Egypt. So we will have to sort of stumble and fall and, and like Joseph sort of go against our brothers, our family, raise our consciousness so we can assume our throne. But that's part of the, the journey, the spiritual journey. It's linked to our third chakra, which is called the Manipura chakra, which is our crown of jewels. It's the fire element. The fire is the element of purification. It's the element of self-worth and self-love. It's linked to Leo in the chart. It's linked to the soul. It's also linked to the sun. The sun is the planet that rules Leo. I call it an STD, saying, thinking, and doing. Once you've looked at your thoughts, emotions, and desires, your personality, 
you've sort of confronted that this is sort of how you show up in the world and what you're judging yourself from with that low level consciousness that you inherited from your parents at conception. And you can love yourself despite those thoughts, emotions, desires, and low level consciousness. Then you can start saying, thinking, and doing, which is the spiritual STD, which is really owning your fire. And there, there's victory and humility, splendor and self-esteem. It's really the midpoint. I just finished posting something on Instagram that we play small or we're extreme narcissists. Well, playing small is just like being narcissistic. It's the same coin, different side. So there has to be a level of humility, but there also has to be a level of victory. There has to be a level of splendor and taking responsibility for the successes that you've done, but there has to be self-esteem as well to recognize when you failed. It's recognizing both. The midpoint, the 48 to 52, is indeed Joseph the king and the self-love. So Hercules was told to go and defeat the Nemean lion. He was given an instruction. You cannot have any help. Uh, Hercules oftentimes had his handy dandy club. He was told, nope, you have to defeat the lion with your bare hands. He found the lion, he chased him into a cave. The cave had two doors and the lion and him kept playing sort of musical chairs around around the cave. And all of a sudden he locked the one wall of the cave and blocked it in with, with bricks and locked the lion in the cave. This is uh, relatable to our pituitary gland and the structure in our brain that is linked to the personality, but it's also our sort of divine will that we have to have right action, right control of thoughts, emotions, and desires, that we have to tame or limit this beast that sort of runs our life. So yes, we have to honor our earthly nature, our earthly desires, emotions, and thoughts, but only 48 to 52% of the time. In order to allow the sort of God-like brilliance to shine through our spirit and divine nature, we're going to need to taper sort of those swings. So he locked the lion in a cave. And again, everything happens on a mountaintop or a cave for a reason. These things are done in private. Spiritual journey is messy. It's sloppy. It's dirty. It's done in private. There's a lot of crying. There's a lot of pain associated. There's a lot of grief. There's not a day that goes by that I don't have a client text me. I had a panic attack. I went into grief or depression for 12 hours. And I say, great, you just avoided cancer. You took an emotion and you process it fully to a feeling. This is important. This is why Hercules was told, you cannot have any assistance, not even your club. You have to tame this with your bare hands. He ripped off the lion skins, comes out of the cave wearing the lion skins, and now everybody in the community can see that he defeated the lion, the personality. This is very um, similar to the vision quest that happens in shamanism. You go on a vision quest, silence, you practically don't eat or drink, you don't talk to anyone, and you have like these sort of realizations. And when you come back from the vision quest, the tribe senses your vibration. They see what you are, and they tell you your role in the society and the community. You start vibrating at that. In Indian philosophy, the guru doesn't talk. The disciple sits at the foot of the guru, and basically the guru doesn't speak. And um, the disciple learns from the vibration of the guru. So not till truth 10 is it the truth of silence, but this is the midpoint to that, where we start sort of taming that lion, that personality, so that the divine will, so that the soul can actually take over and direct the person's life with the individuation process. So there are three levels of fire. In astrology, you have Aries, which is kind of like the match or the flame. Oftentimes it's associated with fear if you're living with no fire whatsoever, playing small. Leo is the midpoint, again, individuation, the solar energy, the fifth house in astrology, oftentimes linked to courage. And then there's Sagittarius, again, at the low vibration, could be a hundred, could be escapism, can be a know-it-all. Again, it's at the low vibration, not that Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius, one is better than the other. I'm using them as a metaphor of small fire, 
the right amount of fire, kind of like Goldilocks and then fire that's sort of out of control. This can be very narcissistic because it'll burn up everything in its path. Whereas this sort of low level fire, the zero burns out quick. It's passion, fast and furious, new, new and shiny. We want to control our fires that are linked to the third chakra, shine bright, sustainable, be with courage and self-worth, what I call the 48 to 52. The reality is you are afraid of your fire. From the moment you've opened your eyes, you have been told, take care of others, meet others' needs, be humble, don't be prideful, don't be boastful, don't be pompous. So some people, clearly narcissistic personality disorder, have been totally told the opposite. You're God, you're king, run the world. But most of us have been said, put that away, tame that. We, we don't want that here. We all know secretly that we're a family of narcissists and we think we're the best and we're better than everybody else, but we're not going to say it. So play small. Playing small, just like full-blown narcissism, is the same thing. It's the 48 to 52, the individuation, the stable, sort of sustained fires of our third chakra that we all want. So the body is the container for the fire. The third chakra is what's called the Agni. The god Agni is the god of fire. The third chakra digests and metabolizes our food, our thoughts, our emotions, our desires. That spiritual TED talk does not destroy us or keep us in safe hatred or self-betrayal because we're constantly processing the fact that we have these thoughts about ourselves that we're narcissists or better than others. What happens is that the eyes, although they're not the main element of fire, they have all elements, they are where the fire is robbed through greed and gluttony and lust and envy and jealousy. So we lose whatever enters our eyes and we want grab more and more and more. We're wasted through the eyes of illusion. It robs the chakra of the third chakra, the fire. So the more we want greedy, lustful, envious, gluttonous, the weaker our third chakra is. And that causes illness. The gut digestion we know in functional nutrition and Ayurvedic medicine is linked to all health processes. Besides actual pooping and stool that it leads to, it's actually the digestibility and metabolism of thoughts, emotions, and desires that are impure, that we deem unworthy of housing the spirit, the body that's dirty because of these impurities. If we waste all the fire through what enters our, our senses, all of our senses, and primarily the eyes, which is the, the, the sense of illusion, then we're robbing the fire that we have within. That's what creates the zero or a hundred. So here's the Vitruvius man, uh, Da Vinci made. The four limbs are basically the four elements and then the spirit or the ether that animates. Here's the symbol of the sun. Again, it's a circle with this one little dot that is the identity of our divine will. The fire is the fire element. In cancer, in the fourth truth of intuition, we had to leave the mass consciousness of the family. So that honey of the diamond. The individual consciousness, which is your divine will, your purpose, what you're here to do in this world happens in Leo, happens with the fire element, happens when you leave the mass consciousness. So it's very important that your identity emerges from the herd. The herd still gives you some indication of your value system, some indication of where you're headed. Your parents where your parents picked on a vibration intentionally. In the sixth chakra, the circle is the void, which is your kingdom. But mom and dad are still sort of like your counsel that is indicating to you certain um, direction of where to go based on what they taught you in terms of value system. So we can't discard the low level consciousness or the family consciousness. We just have to individuate from there. We have to become the center of our cosmos, like in the glyph, of the sun. We have to become aware of our own consciousness, both the good and the bad, the divine consciousness and the earthly consciousness. Only then, that's Leo, that's the five, 
can the 10, which is the man 10, the whole man in Aquarius occur, occur with the humanity. So you can't know humanity's consciousness and aware of humanity's needs if you don't know your own individual being. And Leo is the opposite sign of Aquarius. God is a consuming fire. This is important. Your individual God, your divinity will burn all things that are not you, your thoughts, emotions, desires, low level consciousness. That's why Vedanta says you are the observer. You are not that. So your divine nature should and will sort of purify so that you can absolutely be the expression of your divine self. So in the cosmos, here's the constellation of Leo. You can see the, li the lion. The brightest star is called Regulus. And this is known as kingly power or the royals or the king. In Arabia, it's called as Malachi, the kingly one. And in Greece, it's the star of the king. So this is a universality in terms of Leo, the sun in the solar system. We see this with the eye of Ra. We see this with the son of man. We've seen this identity with the sun. And obviously we know the sun is what keeps us all alive. What I love about this is Regulus is also known as the ruler, the lawgiver. Our fire, if it is not contained in the body, would not be able to shine and burn. First of all, you'd still be part of that universal cookie dough. You would have no individual expression, so that wouldn't serve anybody. Second, you cannot do your spiritual work in the heavens. You have to be in a body. So it's the body that regulates and controls your expression, your divinity, your fire, and is very, very much needed. So it means to regulate, to make regular. What I say is homeostasis. Our divinity is controlled in this function, what I call the divinity through our humanity. It is through our humanness and our earthly body that we indeed can be divine. And this adjusts the rule that puts in good order. Saturn, which is the ruler of the 10th house in astrology, which is like I said, 10 being the full man or the wholeness of, of man. In Capricorn, where we learn the truth of silence and then we enter you know, true service to humanity in Aquarius and truth 11 is all about ruling law abiding, limitations, structure, limit, um, the body, organization, what we deem to be limiting, what we deem to perhaps be oppressing, but it's not, we need limits so that we can rule properly. A regulator is one who, or that which regulates, a lever for regulating motion. We would not be able to fulfill our divine will if we did not have a regulator. The regulator is our own divine spark, our own personal soul, that cookie sort of plop on our pan that's within us, our divine spark, but more importantly, a body to limit the fire, to control our expression. So in Greek mythology, there's Hestia. Hestia, I call her man your fires. When I tell clients, man your fires, Hestia in Greek mythology lived basically in charge of the fires of the Agora. So there were different Eleusian mysteries and other temples and other rituals going on all over the Agora, but Hestia could not leave the fire. She's the one who got the first offering from any sacrifice, any ritual, any ceremony, any mysteries that were going on in Agora, they would bring her the offering first because she could never leave. So I tell clients, man your fires, man your fires, man your third chakra. If your fires are contained, if your fires are at a 48 to 52, you're not taking anyone's fire and no one is taking your fire. This is where you live in balance. This is an extremely important principle. If you're letting someone take your peace of mind or your stability, you're probably doing it to somebody. I also say to parents, don't has it don't uh, inhibit your kids from feeding and flying. If you are helping somebody and it is hindering them because it's meeting your needs and making you feel good, that is not selfless. That is selfish. 
any action that takes your power away or another person's power away is selfish. It's not selfless. Self is when you man your fires and you allow someone else to man theirs, even if it's considered tough love or it comes with some limitation or structure. Hell and fire. The church knew that the element of fire was the thing that was going to make us transmute. Fire is the only element that allows us to raise consciousness transmutation. In mythology, Prometheus stole the fire from the gods to give to the humans, and the gods punished him severely because they knew that if we actually had the ability to have access to fire, we could transmute. It wasn't about making our food warm and keeping our bodies warm. It was about the ability to transmute. Our fire element is the element of transmutation. The church also knew this. So what did they do? They equipped a place called hell so that you would be afraid of your fire. If you were afraid of your fire, they can control you. Transformation versus transmutation. It happens only with the fire element. It's about what's called a la luz. Lucifer means a la luz. This is linked to Pluto archetype, Hades archetype, any uh, character in mythology that lives in the underworld or hell is considered the Satan or the Lucifer archetype. That's our lowest nature. We have to bring it to the light, not kill it off. You have to transmute it. You have to take it from a state of low level consciousness and raise the vibration to high level consciousness. In Ayurveda, there's a beautiful ceremony I used to do called Agnihotra. It's a personal fire that you can purchase a little copper kit. You use cow dung and rice, and you could do it at sunset and sunrise, or you can just do it and make friends with the fire. Um, in shamanism, we use fire medicine, where we have fire ceremonies as part of rituals. We make the fire friendly. We breathe and in, pray into the fire so that we can become comfortable with the fire element. If you are afraid of your own fire, you'll never leave the church or the guru. That is the key to your transmutation. That is the key. Hence, here's Pluto. Bring it to the light. And the next is the key of Chiron. Then you'll get to your spiritual striptease of really owning all the darkness in yourself that will liberate you. So this is the key to our greatness. This is the key to everything is owning our fires. So in order to raise our consciousness from the honey here of low level vibration of the family unit, the beehive or the honey pot in truth four, you need to develop something called a spiritual STD where you say, think and do the same thing. And that's your activity for the week to begin saying, thinking and doing. If you say you're going to go to a party and you're thinking how you don't want to go, you don't have a spiritual STD. You create karma. It's an impure thought. It materializes in the body as illness or an unprocessed emotion, or it's creating some karma or some havoc in the earthly realm. So you have to start saying, thinking, and doing the same. If you don't want to go to the party, don't go. If you have to say to somebody, that doesn't work for me, say it. We have been conditioned that it's rude to ask for what we need. I always say that you have a right to ask for what you need and want, and the other person has a right to say no. So we have to get in this practice of a spiritual STD, saying, thinking, and doing. This is specifically the characteristic of somebody who has become individuated. And Gandhi said happiness, and that's not my word. I'm not one to really believe in happy. I believe more in joy or stability or equanimity. I believe happiness is much more fleeting in the way that humans might experience it. But he said happiness is when you think, when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. And I'm assuming that why he means happiness is because you feel centered, you feel in balance, you feel joy, you feel stable, which are the words that I prefer to happiness. So this is your homework for the week. Please do not be afraid of your fire. Own it, transmute from behavior change to belief change, 
and really get clear with your top two value systems, define them, measure them, see if you're literally living in your honesty, if you're living in integrity, if you're living to your rule book and your philosophy of life. If not, you are not near individuating. Thank you very much.